Аур фир фир спикер профессор Светлана Дилина from Moscow State University. The title of talk, Zero Divisor Graph of Real Kelly Dixon Algebra. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm not Professor Svetlana Zhilina, I'm just Miss Svetlana Zhilina. I just uh, graduated my specialist program from my specialist program, so <clears throat> I'm just a, a student. Uh, so the uh, topic of my talk is zero divisor graphs of real Galilean Dixon algebras. I will explain all, all words in the, the title. And uh, this uh, joint work with my scientific advisor, Professor Alexander Guterman. Uh, okay, uh, first of all, uh, I will recall uh, the definition of uh, real Kelly Dixon algebras. Uh, Kelly Dixon algebras uh, occurred uh, yesterday in the talk of uh, Adam Chapman. Uh, so um, uh, you have already seen this definition. Uh, let A be an algebra over a field F with an involution. Uh, A can be non-computative, uh, non non-associative, uh, or even non-unitive. Uh, we take a non-zero field parameter gamma. Uh, then the algebra, uh, then the algebra uh, A gamma produced by the Kelly-Dixon process is defined as follows. Uh, it's a set uh, is the set of ordered pairs of elements of A uh, with component-wise addition, standard addition, and multiplication and involution are given by these two formulae. Uh, note that gamma occurs only once uh, in the formula of multiplication. Uh, if, if the algebra A is unital and the involution on A is regular, that is for any element, uh, we can uh, define the trace and the norm as follows and they belong to the field. Then the involution on the uh, new algebra is also regular. And for any element, we have the following relation. Uh, its trace uh, coincides with the trace of its first component, and uh, the norm depends on gamma. Okay. Uh, we'll consider only real Kelly Dixon algebras, so we now assume that our field is a field of real numbers. Uh, so let n be uh, an arbitrary non negative integer, uh, and uh, gamma zero and so on, gamma n minus one, be non zero real parameters. Then we define a real Kelly Dixon algebra an as follows. We first take uh, the field of real numbers as the algebra of it itself, and then apply the Kelly Dixon construction n times, first with gamma zero, then with gamma one, and so on, and the last one with gamma n minus one. Uh, clearly, the dimension grows twice on each step. Uh, we begin with the dimension one, so uh, after n steps, we have the dimension equal to two to the nth. Uh, can be seen that uh, the previous algebra a and minus one uh, is embedded into our algebra a n. Uh, so the new algebra is obtained from the previous algebra by adding a new element. We call it tilde e zero, and its square is equal to the last parameter of uh, doubling gamma n minus one. Uh, it's an easy example that the algebra a n with the parameters gamma zero and so on, gamma n minus one, is isomorphic to the algebra a n with the parameters sigmum gamma zero and so on, sigmum gamma n minus one. So since uh, we consider real uh, Kelly's algebras, we uh, can only uh, consider parameters equal to plus minus one. If all the parameters are equal to minus one, then we obtain the algebra of the main sequence. They are the most well known, the most uh, studied, and uh, most authors restrict their attention to the algebra of the main sequence. We denote them by MN. Here, M stands, stands for main. Uh, and it's some of basic examples are the complex numbers, the quaternions, the octonions, and the less usual, the sardinians. If the first n minus one parameter is equal to minus one, it is the same, and the last one is equal to one. Then we obtain, uh, obtain a Kelly Dixon split algebra. We denote it by Hn, and here H stands for hyperbolic. Uh, some examples are the split complex numbers, the split quaternions, the split octonions, and the split sedinions. The split complex numbers differ from the usual complex numbers uh, by the fact that i squared is equal to plus one, not to minus one. So uh, 
the only algebra A0 is just the field of real numbers over itself. Uh, the two algebras A1 are the complex numbers and the split complex numbers. Uh, we, uh, we may assume that there are four uh, algebras uh, A2. However, there are only two of them up to isomorphism. Uh, and similarly, there are two algebras A3, up, uh, S3 up to isomorphism. The main properties of these algebras are as follows. I will define, the, uh, define alternativity and flexibility on, on the next slide. So we lose our properties, good properties, commutativity, associativity, alternativity on each step, but we do not uh, lose flexibility. Okay, uh, the associator of three elements A, B, C, and A is defined by this formula. Clearly, the algebra is associative if and only if every associate is equal to zero. An algebra is called flexible if we have uh, the following quality for all elements A, B in the algebra. And if the algebra is flexible, then we can linearize this quality and obtain that for all A, B, C, we have this quality. Uh, an algebra is called alternative if for, for all elements A, B, uh, we have the form two identities. And uh, uh, it is well known that uh, real Kelly Dixon algebras are alternative if only if their dimension is at most eight, but all of them are flexible. Uh, there is a more accurate uh, definition uh, by, it was introduced by Morena uh, for the case of real Kelly Dixon algebras. Uh, we uh, say that an element A alternates with B, if only if this associate is equal to zero. However, since the algebra A n is flexible, it means also that minus the associator of B A A is equal to zero, so the associator of B A A is also equal to zero. Uh, an element is called alternative if it alternates with every element of the algebra. A alternates strongly with B if A alternates with B and B alternates with A. And A is strongly alternative if it alternates strongly with every element of the algebra. Uh, now I will discuss uh, relation graphs. Uh, generally, relation graphs uh, serve for the purpose of uh, visualization of a binary algebraic relation R on an arbitrary algebraic structure S. And its relation graph uh, is defined uh, is denoted by gamma sub R of S. Its vertices are either elements of the equivalence classes in S, and there is an edge from X to Y, if and only if uh, X and Y are, uh, satisfy our relation R. So uh, the resultant graph is undirected, if and only if R is symmetric. Relation graphs uh, uh, are usually defined on objects of some category, for example, uh, on some bank spaces or some algebras or a subclass of algebras, uh, and they carry a lot of information. The most powerful thing that we can do is to solve the isomorphism problem. This can be done uh, not uh, not ever <clears throat> not in all cases, but sometimes it can be done. Uh, that is, we want to show that two objects of this category are isomorphic if and only if their relation graphs are isomorphic. And this was already proved for some relation graphs, for example, for directed Birgov James orthogonality graphs of smooth and reflexive Banach spaces with dimension at least three, and for orthogonality graphs of finite dimensional form of real simple Jordan algebras. So the special cases uh, of relation graphs are orthogonality and zero revisor graphs. Let A be an arbitrary algebra over a field F. We denote by Z of A the set of its zero devices and by Z LR of A the set of its two-sided zero devices. Then the subordinate graph gamma O of A is defined uh, as follows. Uh, its vertex set is a set of lines passing through zero uh, in the set of two-sided zero devices of A and two lines are connected, if only if uh, they are distinct, uh, so we prohibit loops, and their representatives are orthogonal, and by orthogonality we mean, we mean that both products of uh, A and B are equal to zero. 
Clearly, this relation is symmetric, so this graph is undirected. We can also uh, consider the directed zero divisor graph. Uh, its vertex set differs uh, from the previous one in the sense that we consider all zero divisors, not only two sided zero divisors. And there is an edge from A to B, if only if A and B are distinct, and AB equals zero. So these graphs are well defined, and we will often uh, write just A instead of the line passing through A to, to avoid. Uh, to, to long notation. In the case of real Kelly Dixon algebra, there are some uh, connections between these two graphs. For example, it can be proved that the set of zero divisors of A n coincide with a set coincides with a set of two-sided zero divisors. All zero divisors are two-sided, uh, so we do not uh, have to distinguish them. And if A B is an edge in a zero divisor graph then uh, the opposite to it is also an edge in, uh, in, gamma, in, in the zero divisor graph, that is AB is an edge in the orthogonality graph. If only if one of the following condition holds, uh, either the line B is generated by the conjugate of A and the norm of A equals zero, or the traces of both A and B are equal to zero. So we wish to solve the isomorphism problem we wish to show that two real Kelly Dixon algebras are isomorphic if only if their orthogonality graphs are isomorphic. However, uh, we know that uh, real Kelly Dixon algebras are alternative if and only if uh, n is uh, not greater than three. So uh, in the algebra A5 and uh, in the higher dimensional algebras, we have zero devices, uh, which are very, very hard to study and to classify. Uh, so we cannot describe zero devices and moreover, we cannot de describe the orthogonality graph. Uh, so what do we do to solve this problem? We consider good zero devices. Uh, what are good zero devices? Uh, these are zero devices which, which satisfy some additional conditions on the norm and the alternativity of their components. So assume that AB alternates strongly with CD in the algebra AN and the product of a, b, and c, d equals zero in the next algebra, a and plus one. Assume also that the norms of c and d satisfy this additional condition for some real parameter chi. Uh, here, the norms of c and d are just some real numbers. We have the following two qualities. Then we had one pair of zero devices and we obtain a new pair of zero devices. The, its first element is the second element of the previous one, and the second element is defined is uniquely defined by uh, our two elements. And here, here is chi. Uh, indeed, we can just write uh, the product of uh, these two elements by the definition, and then we have to use uh, uh, alternativity four times: here, 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 and here. And then the magic happens, and we have just these two uh, expressions, which are in the form formulation of our lemma. They are equal to zero, so uh, the whole uh, formula collapses, and we have just zero. Okay, but when does this condition on the norms of C and D hold? If the norms of C and D are equal to zero, both of them, then we can take any real kind. However, this is not the interesting case. We do not like it. We consider another case. Uh, otherwise, the norms of C and D are equal up to multiplication plus minus one. And chi uh, is equal to this, to this chi. Uh, uh, here, gamma n is equal to plus minus one. So chi is also equal to plus minus one. We call this condition asterisk, and we say that C and D satisfies uh, condition asterisk with chi. Uh, this condition is satisfied automatically if uh, our algebra A and plus one is either the algebra of the main sequence or is a Kelly Dixon split algebra, since in this case, we immediately have the norm of C equal to the norm of D, but just uh, for with uh, the restriction on the alternativity here. Uh, and uh, 
hold the values of chi equal to minus one and plus one respectively and are uniquely determined. Uh, however, this condition uh, can fail in general, and there are some examples of it. Uh, I just omit them here in my talk. Uh, why alternative elements are also good? Uh, Moran approved the following lemma. If x alternates with y in the algebra, then the norms of the, both their products are equal to the product of their norms. Uh, this uh, equality is very similar to the definition of composition algebras. However, in composition algebras, this equality is satisfied for all elements. And uh, in Kelly-Dixon uh, algebras, uh, it is satisfied rather rarely. For example, if uh, x uh, and uh, alternates with y. Uh, so let C and D satisfy condition asterisk uh, and uh, the norm of uh, either the norm of A or the norm of B is not equal to zero. Then by using this lemma, we can easily obtain that AB and this new element, the conjugate of AC and minus chi DA, also could satisfy condition asterisk with the same value of chi. Moreover, uh, we can show that the elements AC and DA alternate strongly with the elements A, B, C, D. So why is this useful? Uh, we now return to our lemma. Okay. We had one pair of elements and uh, it satisfied the conditions of uh, our lemma and we obtained a new pair of elements. However, this new pair of elements also satisfies the conditions of this lemma. So we can use this lemma again. And then we obtain a new pair of uh, zero devices. We can then proceed and uh, repeat this process six times. And uh, after that, we obtain the following six cycle in the zero divisor graph of our algebra. We had a B connected to CD, and then we obtained a new element. Then we have A minus B, a difference from A B only in the second component, then C minus D. Then again, the element which differs only the second component from those one. And then again, AB, and we have a cycle. And this was in the case of arbitrary real Kalyadidson algebras. If our algebra is the algebra of the main sequence, then we have some additional properties so which uh, make the situation even better. So now our algebra is the algebra of the main sequence. Moran approved the following useful uh, lemma. Uh, he showed that two elements x and y uh, in the algebra of the main sequence satisfy x, y equal to zero, if and only if y, x is also equal to zero. So what follows from it? Uh, it follows that uh, with any edge in the zero divisor graph, we have the opposite one to it. So the zero divisor graph can be obtained from the orthogonality graph just by replacing every undirected edge with a pair of directed edges. So we have this corollary. What else can we say about uh, zero devices uh, in the algebra of the main sequence? Any zero devices satisfies uh, that uh, the traces of its components are equal to zero. We call such an element doubly pure if it satisfies this condition. And uh, if we had one product equal to zero, x and y, equal to zero, and we define an element till the y as y till, uh, times till the e zero, uh, and it is equal to, we swap the components and take the first one with the minus sign, then the condition x, y is equal to zero is equal to the fact that x till the y is equal to zero. So our corollary about the hexagons, uh, in the case of the algebra of the main sequence, attains the following form. Uh, let a b alternate strongly with c d and the product of a b and c d be equal to zero. Uh, we do not need here the, uh, the assumption that a b and c d satisfy condition asterisk since it is an algebra of the main sequence and they satisfy it automatically with the chi equal to minus one. Then there exists the following six cycle in the orthogonality graph. Uh, here is no longer chi and we can omit the conjugate because uh, because of uh, the previous lemma, and uh, all uh, edges are undirected. Moreover, by using the last part of this lemma, 
we can extend this hexagon to the so-called double hexagon. Uh, the elements of the outer hexagon are just the elements of the hexagon, and the inner ones are tilde, uh, ones from the outer hexagon. So we have a, b, and b minus one, minus a. Uh, the difference uh, b minus one is uh, minus tilde a, b, but this doesn't matter since we consider lines. And uh, they are equivalent in the graph, that is, they have uh, the same sets of neighbors. Uh, one can also uh, consider this as a six uh, bipartite graphs K to two. Here is the graph K to two. Uh, equal, uh, and they are grouped together. There are six of them and they are all grouped together. The double hexagon uh, also satisfies uh, a very convenient multiplication table of vertices. We denote by F0 just E0 and by tilde F0 just tilde E0. The elements F1 to F6 are the elements of the outer hexagon. The elements tilde F1 to tilde F6 are the corresponding elements of the inner hexagon. And the last six elements are just auxiliary. Uh, they have one of the components equal to zero and the other one equal to the product of, of components of some zero devices. And we then have the following multiplication table. It clearly has a block structure. Uh, there are eight blocks with zeros in them. This actually means that uh, this, uh, the elements uh, whose product uh, is zero, they a pair of zero devices. For example, F4 and F1 are a pair of zero devices. And there are eight blocks which are, don't have zeros in them. And they resemble the multiplication table of the quaternions. However, they are not as isomorphic to it. Uh, there is no uh, an isomorphism that can uh, turn, the, turn them into the multiplication table of the quaternions. Uh, okay, we now uh, resume our task of uh, solving the isomorphism problem. So, what can we do? We have already uh, understood that we cannot. Uh, we can study the complete, the whole graph uh, of the granitic graph of, of the algebra. So we study some good elements and what are good elements? Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce the standard basis of a real Galactic algebra. So it is uh, very well known. Uh, the standard basis of the zero algebra is just the element E0 equal to one. And then we construct uh, the standard basis inductively. If n is at least one, then the standard basis we denote it by En of the algebra An consists of the elements of this form. Uh, we either have a standard basis, a base element uh, from the previous al algebra as the first component and then zero, or we can swap them. So we have two to the nth standard base, basis elements. And one can verify that E0 is always a unit element of the algebra An. Uh, recall also that we have tilde E0 defined as the pair 0 and E0. And we also denote E n prime as a set of standard basis elements without E0. And E n two primes uh, is a set of E n without E0 and tilde E0. And we also write tilde A equal to a uh, times tilde E0 for all elements of the algebra. So standard basis elements are good in the sense uh, that we understand the, uh, in the, that sense that we mean. Uh, for example, any standard basis element is alternative. And the norm of every standard basis element is equal to plus minus one. So all elements of this form we call these elements pairs of basis elements. So just find condition asterisk of some chi equal to plus minus one. And we can apply corollary uh, about the hexagons to orthogonal pairs of uh, elements of this form since uh, all of their components are alternative. So they're good and there is a finite number of them. So we can consider a finite subgraph 
uh, on the set of uh, this lines passing through these elements. More formally, we define the supernatural graph gamma sub E of A n plus one on pairs of basis elements as a subgraph of the orthogonality graph on the vertex set of uh, lines passing through uh, the elements of this form and the z pairs of basis elements, which are zero devices. And the first component is not equal to E zero. Is this means that the trace of this element is equal to E zero. We need this condition uh, to always uh, pass to the second case in our proposition about the relation between zero device graphs and the graphs. Since the first case is uh, very narrow and uh, this is not the interesting case and we have, uh, we want the second case. Okay, so we proceed. Uh, and uh, these elements are very, very good, namely for any two elements, A, B and C, D. Uh, which belong to the set of zero devices, if their products, if their product A, B, C, D is equal to zero, then we know that the products of their components are either equal or minus, uh, or one of them is equal to minus the other. So if A, B, and C, D belong to the same com connected component of our graph, then A, B equals plus minus C, D. Uh, and moreover, uh, these two elements are, are standard basis elements up to multiplication to plus minus one. So for any element uh, X, which is a standard basis element, we denote by C of X, the subgraph of our graph on the set of vertices AB, such that AB equals plus minus X. We have shown that if X and Y are distinct, uh, then C of X and C of Y are not connected to each other. And we can show that uh, for any a, B in C of X, we have the chi uh, of A, B equal to just gamma N uh, times the norm of A, B, and A, B is equal to plus minus X. So it is equal to gamma N times the norm of X. And this value is the same for all elements of C of X. So we can define uh, chi just on C of X uh, by uh, gamma N, times the, the norm of x, and it is called the characteristic of C of x. We now give some low dimension examples. Uh, moreover, we completely describe these graphs for uh, dimension at, at most 16. Uh, so if n is equal to zero, then we have uh, n, a n plus one is either the complex numbers or the split complex numbers, and in both cases, uh, we have an empty set of vertices. If n is equal to one, then we either have an empty set of vertices. This case corresponds to the quaternions. Or the graph consists of two disconnected vert vertices, or it consists of four disconnected vertices, as here. Two of them are in the C of E0, and two of them are in C of E1. And this is a graph of the split quaternions. Excuse me. If n is equal to two, then either the graph has an empty set of vertices. This case corresponds to the quaternions, or the graph consists of two hexagons, undirected hexagons, or it consists of four hexagons, as here. This is a graph of the split quaternions. Uh, note that the first uh, connected component which uh, corresponds to E0 is also a hexagon. We just pass here, 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 and here. So we have four hexagons. If n is equal to three, then there are four cases instead of three. We either have seven double hexagons or three double hexagons and four bundles of hexagons. Do not worry, I will explain these words on the next slide or four double hexagons, three bundle of hexagons, and one almost complete seven, seven bipartite graph, or seven bundles and one almost complete seven, seven bipartite graph. Uh, a double hexagon is as follows. We have already seen it. A bundle of hexagons differs uh, by adding two new elements and they are arranged in a, arranged in a new way. 
And an almost complete 7-7 bipartite graph uh, is obtained from the complete 7-7 bipartite graph by removing the edges which uh, <clears throat> connect to the opposite vertices. So we don't have this edge, this edge, this edge, and so on. We can see that if the last parameter, the last parameter is equal to minus one, then we obtain seven connected components and seven is equal to two to the third minus one. And if the last parameter is equal to one, then we have two to the third connected components, that is eight con connected components. And this, no this is not a coincidence. Uh, we will have the same relation in all, uh, all the following uh, graphs. So oh, to sum up, uh, we have uh, for n equal to one, two non-isomorphic algebras and three non-isomorphic graphs. For n equal to two, two algebras and three graphs. And for n equal to three, uh, finally four algebras and four graphs. Uh, by the use of our complete classification, uh, we can obtain the following corollary. Uh, <clears throat> if n, m, and m uh, are between one and three, and gamma lambda are two sequences of parameters. And if also the graphs of two algebras have non empty sets of vertices and are isomorphic, then the corresponding algebras are isomorphic. If n and m are equal to three, then the curves always also holds, and we have four algebras and four graphs. The numbers can set. Okay. But this is not true for n and m between one and two because there are more graphs than algebras. So there is no a bit bijection between them. <clears throat> we now pass to the arbitrary case. Uh, and uh, so our main objective is to solve the isomorphism problem. And we have shown that this is impossible for n uh, less than three. So, and we have proved this for n equal to three. So we are going to use induction on n at least three. Uh, and we first uh, learned how to construct our graph from the parameters of the algebra. We consider four types of uh, con connected components. So we, we just, uh, <clears throat> we don't uh, uh, know yet that C of X is a connected component, but uh, it is uh, almost, uh, <clears throat> almost always. And we consider four types of silvex depending on the type of X. Uh, in the first two types, X is equal to either to E0 or to tilde E0, and the last two, uh, two ice folds. Excuse me. <clears throat> so uh, we will show that for N and plus three, these graphs C of X are exactly as connected components except for possibly C of E0, which has an empty set of vertices is if the last parameter is equal to minus one. So on this slide, we provide an explicit form of the connected components of, of the first two types for, the, for various values of the last two parameters. C of E0 depends on the last parameter only. Uh, if it is equal to one, then we have the following graph. It is an almost complete bipartite graph. And if gamma n is equal to minus one, when, then we have just uh, an empty set of vertices. And C of tilde is zero, depends on the value of the product of the last two components, uh, two parameters, and it can be described as follows. Uh, what do we want from these graphs? Uh, one can verify that if n is at least three, then all these graphs are connected uh, and the diameter, diameters are equal to three. We now construct uh, the remaining components by induction on N. We denote by AN with a circle, the algebra AN. Uh, it has dimension twice uh, less than our algebra N, N plus one. Its first n minus one parameters are the same as in a n plus one, and the last one is just the last parameter of uh, our algebra. And a n with a bullet differs from a n, a n with a circle by the last parameter. It is equal to the product of the last two parameters. 
So we are going to reduce the similarity condition in our algebra a n plus one to the similarity conditions in these two algebras. So let a, b, c, d be pure linearly independent basis elements in a n minus one. And uh, we consider first the con connected uh, components of the third type. Let x and y belong to the set. Then x and y are orthogonal in our new algebra. Uh, if and only if a, b, and c, d are orthogonal in a and with a circle. So we reduced our orthogonality condition to the previous algebra. And we denote this condition by a dashed edge uh, in our next slide. Uh, in the case of the connected component of the fourth type, if x and y belong to the set, then x and y are orthogonal in a plus one, if and only if a, b, and c, d are orthogonal in a and with a boolean. And we denote this by a dotted edge. So connected components of type three look at, uh, as follows. They depend on the value of chi. Uh, on the left, there is chi equal to minus one, and on the right, we have chi equal to one. Uh, if chi is equal to minus one, then we have four elements which you, which we call special. Uh, why why is it special? They play the role of halves uh, since every other element is connected to exactly one pair of them. So C A B is connected to the left pair of special elements and tilde A tilde B is connected to the right pair of special elements. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so the diameter of this graph can be shown to be equal to three. Since we take, for example, AB, uh, then move to the nearest special element, say tilde X tilde is zero, and then uh, go from, uh, construct a path from this element to some other elements, for example, to tilde C minus tilde D. And uh, there is always such path. So the diameter of the graph is equal to three. And if chi is equal to one, then we have two ele extra elements. They have their first, their last components equal to E0 or to minus E0. Uh, and they're special now. And uh, the previous four, ele the four elements which were special on the left side are not special now. They're here. Uh, and the diameter of, the, of this graph is uh, again three. And there is the radoted, uh, the radished edges. Uh, say C minus D is connected to B minus gamma N A uh, by dish edge. So there is an edge if and only if A, B, and C, D are orthogonal in A and with a circle. The kinetic components of type four are very, very similar. Uh, so we have the, the same two cases. They just uh, differ by the labels on the vertices. They are a bit different. And we have dotted edges instead of dashed edges. So we now reduce the sagonality conditions to A and with a bullet. Okay. So we have shown that uh, if n is at least three, then C of x uh, is connected for any uh, basis element x and its diameter is equal to three, except for possibly C of E zero, which has, can have an empty set of vertices if gamma N is equal to minus one. So these graphs C of X are exactly the connected components of our graph. So we have the following proposition. If N is at least three, then our signality graph has either two to the n or two to the n minus one connected components, depending on the value of the last parameter. Uh, the number of the vertices in a connected component is given by this formula, which depends only on n and uh, uh, the value of uh, the characteristic of c. So we can see that the first case, there are two elements more than the second. So this proposition doesn't contrast, contradict to the explicit uh, form of the graphs of 16 dimensional algebras and uh, it should be so, so this is not surprising. Uh, 
what do we do now? Oh, we had an algebra and we constructed its graph. We now want to uh, solve the reverse problem. We have a graph of an unknown algebra and without labels on the vertices of our graph. And we want to determine the parameters of our algebra up to isomorphism. We have proved that we can do this for n equal to three in uh, our corollary. Uh, so we, we are going to use induction on n. We have the following proposition. Its first, uh, first part follows for the previous proposition. Uh, it is very straightforward. If n is at least three, then we can determine n, the last parameter, the last parameter, and if the last parameter is equal to one, then can, uh, we can find c of zero because we just know how it looks. Uh, moreover, we can find the characteristic of each connected component c. If n is at least four, uh, then we can also find c of tilde is zero, and so we can determine the previous parameter gamma and minus one, but uh, this is not as trivial as the uh, previous part, the first part. However, we can do this. So we have found C of zero and, excuse me, okay. uh, and uh, C of tilde is zero. Uh, <clears throat> so we now have uh, the remaining part of our graph when N is at least four. So we have just the connecting components of the third and the fourth types. And we wish to obtain the previous graph. But which graph is previous? There are two previous graphs. Uh, they correspond to algebras A and with the circle and with the board. We already know the last parameters of these two algebras, so we have the connected components which correspond to E0. Consider an element X which is a pure basis element in the algebra A and minus one. Uh, then the connected components, uh, com component C of X should be reduced to the connected component of the graph of A and with a circle. And C of tilde X should be reduced to the connected component of the graph of A and with a boot. If C of X uh, is transformed that then chi is preserved, and if C of tilde x, uh, x is transformed, then chi changes side. So well, on the next slide, we show the process of reduction, we call it reduction. And the bold lines uh, denote those edges and vertices we have preserved. So you hear these elements and uh, the edges between them are preserved and all others are deleted. And this is the case uh, of the connected component of the third type with chi equal to minus one. And if chi is equal to one, then we preserve these, these vertices and these edges. Uh, okay, uh, and uh, if we consider the connected components of the fourth type, then since uh, now the value of chi changes sign, we also need to change, uh, to swap our sides, the left and right. So know that we swapped them, uh, kind of. Uh, so now we, if chi is equal to minus one, then we preserve these edges. And if chi is equal to one, then we preserve these edges. However, uh, this is not the end of the algorithm since uh, we use here uh, the, we, we know here which elements are special, we use this. And we also have to know which connected components are of the third type and which are of the fourth. Uh, however, we can do this, uh, namely by this algorithm, but uh, this is too long to present in this talk. Okay, so we, we can now uh, construct the previous graph and uh, we now are ready to prove our main theorem. Uh, we will use uh, essentially the uh, following lemma by Ekin and Sazaya. Uh, they showed that uh, if n is at least three and gamma and lambda are two sequences of parameters, then the algebras uh, of the same dimension uh, two to the n plus one, and uh, which correspond to gamma and lambda are isomorphic, if only if the last parameters are equal 
and the previous algebras are isomorphic. Uh, I should note that uh, they proved this lemma for the case of an arbitrary field, and I just used the field of real numbers. Uh, in, in the arbitrary field, uh, this condition takes the form that the inverse of gamma n times lambda n should be a square of some non-zero element of the field. And uh, in the real case, since we consider only parameters equal to plus minus one, we have this equality. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so our main theorem is as follows. Let n and, and m be at least three, gamma and lambda be two sequences of parameters, uh, and then the algebras which correspond to these uh, parameters are isomorphic, if only if their graphs are isomorphic. Uh, how do we prove this? Uh, we immediately obtain n equal to m on both sides. Uh, here we have it from the dimension, and here we have it from the proposition that we had. Uh, and then we prove the theorem by induction on n, uh, just by our, by our two processes. We can construct the graph by the parameters of the algebra inductively, and we can uh, find the parameters of the algebra by its graph. Okay. So uh, if uh, what happens if n and m are less than three? If the graphs uh, have non-empty sets of vertices, then the implication from right to left holds for all values of n and m. However, the implication from left to right may, may fail for n and m less than three, and we have shown that uh, um, before. Okay. So some open questions. Uh, we have studied uh, elements which satisfy some additional conditions on the normal alternativity. But what happens we, if we uh, preserve the conditions on alternativity, but uh, do not require the condition S to risk? So what happens if an element AB is double alternative? So both of its components are alternative in the previous algebra, but this condition fails. What are the important properties uh, do the double alternative elements with condition S to risk possess? Uh, now we have uh, explicit formulas uh, formula for the annihilators, centralizes, orthogonalizes. We know that these elements are very good. However, what can we also uh, what can we say about them? Also, uh, <clears throat> in real Kerry-Dix algebras, uh, orthogonality and commutativity, uh, orthogonality and commutativity as relations uh, differ by one linear equa equation. So uh, it is clear that these two relation, relations should be very closely related, and thus uh, the graphs should be related. So how, uh, what, is, what is this relation? Uh, we know that uh, for the case of the sedinans, uh, it is not as simple as uh, we can imagine, and uh, we the graph becomes rather complicated, the commutativity graph. But the asymptotic graph is uh, very well studied. And uh, <clears throat> it is also interesting to see uh, under which conditions are two elements of a real kinetic algebra or equivalent or equivalent. That is, have the same orthogonalizer or centralizer. Uh, so here are some references. Uh, uh, our, my talk was based on the works uh, on the third, sixth, and seventh papers. Uh, I would also like to mention the works by Bees, Daga, Saxon, and by Morena. Uh, they studied zero, zero devices in uh, the algebra of the main sequence, and uh, more, many of their methods can be transferred to the arbitrary case. Uh, and I also use this uh, paper by Aiken and Cezai, uh, namely the, uh, the last lemma. Uh, in their work, it is a corollary. Okay, thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions?
Many thanks, uh, Svetlana. Any questions or comments, please? Okay, I assume that there are no questions. So can I stop the demonstration? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you.